Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 16th Cine Youth Film Festival. My name is Ryan Saunders, and I'm on the programming team here. Well, I'm the Cine Youth Festival director, um, and we're so excited to be presenting this Q&A for the um, It's All Relative program, which is a program that sort of focuses on films about siblings and, and that relationship and sort of everyone's identity and how they influence each other um, through their siblings. So I have two filmmakers with me here tonight and I'd like to start off by having each of you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your film. Um, so Mariah, you can get started. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mariah Barrera. Um, I am an 18 year old filmmaker um, and a student at Columbia University. Um, so my film, My Brother's Keeper, is kind of a lyrical meditation on my father's experiences uh, with incarceration and brotherhood and the relationship between the two. So it just kind of explores that um, dynamic of uh, incarceration in the context of, you know, brothers and what it means to, um, you know, have that happen with your siblings. So, yeah. Great. And then Sharam, you can introduce yourself. What's up, guys? Uh, my name is Sri Ram. I'm a filmmaker from Michigan, currently based in Chicago. And my film's uh, Brothers, and it's about two Indian American brothers um, growing up under the shadow of a domineering brother, uh, mother, and they have to figure out um, how to, you know, overcome their uh, struggles between themselves and their family. Thank you. So, you know, Sharam, I actually want to start with you because um, your film has an interesting Cine Youth connection. Um, you had a film in 2019 in Cine Youth um, called Boober. And then you, we had a pitch competition and you had actually pitched uh, yeah. this film um, to a group of people at Cine Youth. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, just how the film has evolved since then, from like your initial pitch in 2019 at Cine Youth to sort of where you ended up with the finished product. That's such an awesome question. That's hilarious because I was thinking about that. Um, so when I pitched uh, at Cine Youth at um, 2019, that was the first festival that I ever got, like went to in my life. I was I'm, I didn't know anything about like filmmaking really. So when I showed up to the pitch. I had nothing. Everybody had PowerPoints and slide decks and I just stood in front of the presentation with a blank screen. And like the only thing I had was like my conviction that my idea was good. And my pitch was all over the place and everybody there was like, dude, this kid's crazy. And Ryan was like, this is a mistake. Why did we put this guy on? <laughs> well, I definitely but, did that. Yeah. <laughs> you, had a, you had a lot of energy. It was a really impactful pitch. But like it had no direction. Everyone's like asking me questions like, so what are the logistics of this? Do you have a script? Do you have anything? <laughs> like, no, no, I don't, I don't. <laughs> and yeah, that's before I even knew about screenwriting. I just used to type it on Google Docs. But over time, I kept um, like learning about how to do it properly. And then it just evolved on its way. And then as I was making it, I was learning. So that was my first experience making a true narrative film. Yeah, because it's it is funny though because I do remember your pitch and I remember in encountering the film I was like oh of course like this is the film that you pitched in in 2019 so the vision was was there um, so yeah it's just it's it's great that you were able to make that transition from from doc to to fiction um, and and so Mariah your film is is a doc and it's a very personal one um, and it's a mixture of a lot of different things right you have family photos, you have some footage that you seem to have shot like on your own, like, cause it's not all home video, right? We talked a little bit about this just before we, we got on here, um, that it was sort of digital photography that had like a filter over it. Um, if you, maybe you could talk about um, mixing all that media for a documentary, the mixture of, of like archival photos and then like recreations and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think one of my, um like biggest challenges or something that like consumed a lot of my time while making this film was figuring out how I wanted to tell the story. Initially, I wanted to do just kind of like a cut and dry traditional documentary. I, I ended up like having like two hours of footage of me just interviewing my dad um, in our basement. And I kind of thought, you know, I would just do like interview cut with like B-roll that I kind of shoot. Um, but then when I was rewatching the footage of like, you know, the stories my dad was 
was like telling me just about his whole like journey and you know the questions I was asking him about um I kind of started thinking that maybe doing like a traditional documentary wouldn't do this particular story justice um especially because like my main goal with this was to kind of provoke empathy in people who don't necessarily have any experience with this or who don't whose families haven't like endured this kind of like trauma um and so i honestly felt that the best way of doing that would be to kind of um mesh narrative and documentary elements so kind of like framing my documentary around that like very specific memory that my dad had and and then kind of using you know like a mix of things that i shoot to kind of help visualize those memories and like bring them to life but also like ground it in something real which would be like my family photos to kind of remind people that like yeah i'm like i'm making this more like dramatic but it's still based on like a real family's experience and so i think that that was kind of like my inspiration behind like meshing all of those things is just trying to tell the story in the best way that i can yeah i mean there's definitely a certain amount of passion involved just by having it be a performance as opposed to just a straight interview you know and i think that there's something unique about that and it certainly affected me when i first watched it um, can you talk a bit about that aspect of performance um, and just like the recording of the, the voiceover for the film? Yeah, you kind of cut out. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. It's oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. The, I was talking about the, um, the, the idea of performance and how that like draws, you know, empathy as, as you had discussed. So I was curious if you could talk about um, just directing that performance and, you know, creating that voiceover, just that process. Um, yeah, so actually when I uh, was editing or like I I wrote the voiceover um, kind of I was listening to like those two hours I had of you know, my dad doing like the interview and then I kind of started distilling some of the most important parts out of it and poetry is a large or like poetry prose is a large part of my filmmaking process and I kind of see that as the bridge between narrative and documentary at least like in the context of my films um, and so when I was like listening to um, the interview I did with my dad, I kind of started distilling like the main important themes and started writing out like kind of like a poetry adaptation of like what he was telling me. And then um, once I wrote something out, me and my dad, I had my dad read it and he kind of tweaked it and put things more in his own words, his perspective, how he would actually say it. And then when I made this film, um, I actually went to go stay with my sister who lives in Saginaw, Michigan, because I live in Grand Rapids, and I gave myself two weeks. I was like, I'm gonna have two weeks to like edit this film and do everything. I kind of wanted to be away from the distraction of home and school. So I like gave myself two weeks to edit it. And so I was actually directing my dad, like his voice over while he was in Grand Rapids, I was in Saginaw. So I kind of gave him, you know, like the voice over and gave him so, like kind of an idea of how I wanted him to um, say it. Then he would send me um, his voiceovers and then I'd like kind of give him some tips on what I want him to change. But it ended up being like the second one that he sent me where I just listened to it and was like, this is it. I'm just going to start editing to this voiceover. So it, we kind of did it from afar, but I think having my dad so involved in the process made his read through very like genuine and like in his own voice. Yeah, that's interesting. I, Cause I was curious about that. Um, and you sort of then answered my other question about, you know, directing your father and having him um, recite that. I know I've, I've actually made some films with my father in them as well. And I, I found that the it's, it's much easier for him if I'm not there. Um, so I, I feel like we did some takes and it was a little stiff or weird. And so I was just gave him some advice and I said, I'll just, I'll just step away. Like, I'll just go in the garage. Like if you could, you know, if there was someone else there. So I, I could see, you know, cause I was curious if, if he's, you know, was this his first time and if he had like struggled with, with that recitation, cause it sounds so natural. Um, I think part of that, like I said, was, um, Kind of like I think that the biggest thing was having him go through it after I wrote it and like catering it to his own voice because there was like when I originally wrote it out you know I kind of was writing it how I think that it should be said but um, him rewriting it out almost kind of in the way that he talks I think it just kind of came naturally to him and I wanted it to be as natural and in his own voice as possible so I kind of I gave him a lot of freedom with um, how he wanted to do it. That certainly comes through. I mean, I figured that there was like a co-author element to it, um, just because again, it 
you know, it's lyrical, but at the same time, it does sound like it's his voice. It doesn't sound like he's like playing a part, you know? Um, well, you were, so you were talking about the certain things that link the, your narrative and documentary filmmaking. Shira, maybe you could talk about that transition for you moving from documentary to, to narrative filmmaking and what were, um, what surprised you on that journey? For sure. And first I want to say, Mariah, I like, I really like how you said that poetry is a way to link the two. I'm definitely going to steal that and use that in the next one I'm doing. That's awesome. I really like it. But yeah, so documentary um, to narrative, the, I shoot all my own stuff as of now. So the, the shooting style was very, very documentary. Like it was um, very observational and like a lot of movement, sometimes excessive movement. And um, it was very unstructured. The, the shooting was very, very unstructured, which was a good and bad at times. And that's what linked the two styles together. And yeah, yeah, it was, I shot it similar to as I would shoot a doc, as if it was a documentary of the two characters, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I actually noticed that and was thinking about that while watching your film, the sort of like your own visual signature in a way. There's there's something very clean about your images um, and the light and like sort of digital texture to it. But at the same time, it's extremely raw, as you were saying, because it's handheld. Um, there's lots of movement. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that visual style and how you sort of, you, you know, crafted that. Mm, um. I, when I, every time I always um, express myself, I don't know, in art or in film, I always want a certain level of hardness and power and almost aggressive violence. Um, I, I want you to feel the punch of the image. And the only way that I, I know how to do that is I am physically touching the camera. And it's kind of weird when I say it, but I, the energy from my, my body needs to be transferred to the camera and then it can suddenly like get a more punchier impact than if somebody was else was to do the exact same movement. So if I'm there and I'm physically in the scene and I'm moving with the characters, I'm like an observer of the characters, I'm in the scene physically, um, naturally I think that the impact will have a little bit more punch, uh, a little bit more um, dynamicism to it that can help keep the engagement and the vitality of the story together. Certainly, yeah. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all that you were operating um, because again, it, it does feel like a very personal and like active uh, role just with the camera there. Um, speaking in terms of just like shooting, um, Mariah, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges maybe you had mentioned that you were shooting this film during the pandemic, the, the sequences that you shot and then later put in. Um, just like sort of, you know, was that challenging um, shooting stuff during the pandemic? How did that work for you? Um, yeah, so I, um, I guess I've always kind of worked independently um, with my film. So never really had the opportunity to um, bring on a lot of people for my projects. I kind of got very used, um, like during high school when I started taking my film endeavors more seriously, um, I kind of got used to doing all parts of the process by myself, um, kind of out of just like a need. It was like, I want to tell this story and I don't necessarily have all the people around me to do it, but so I'm just going to take it into my own hands. So in terms of that, um, that wasn't necessarily like the pandemic and kind of, you know, um, obviously a lot of people having to pivot to doing things more independently and not being able to work with the crew. That wasn't something that necessarily posed a challenge for me because I was used to it and I felt like that that's how I thrive, at least now. Collaboration is something I definitely um, see the value in and want to start pursuing when I have the opportunity to. So um, that part wasn't necessarily challenging, but I will say like before my film, so kind of like planning it, um, I felt like in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of pressure, at least for me. And I, I feel like I've seen it with other artists to be creating something. It's like you have all this free time. Why aren't you taking advantage of it? And I definitely internalized that to the point where I think it almost like hindered um, my creative process and kind of like made me feel so hyper worried about creating something great. And that was something that like kind of stressed me out and was a challenge before making this film. But I, I realized that once I just kind of like 
let go of that pressure of like, I need to create something like amazing right now because I have all this free time. Um, I think that, you know, the idea for this film and then the process of like creating it um, came a lot more naturally and was um, a lot less challenging for me. So I think like before making my film, the pandemic definitely posed some challenges. Um, but while doing it, I think I, I learned how to just work with it. Yeah, and then I, I guess, you know, maybe this wasn't a challenge, but I'm curious about how you initially then proposed this project to your father um, and what his reaction was when you said, because you've talked about a bit about how initially you were just recording interviews when you weren't sure exactly how the film would sort of be pieced together and how it would work. Um, but yeah, when you initially approached him with the idea of making a film about him and his story and his brothers, um, how did that go? Um, I definitely think like when I first started making films, I made it very clear to myself and my family. I think that a lot of what I want to create would be based around them because I feel like my family just has, you know, so many like unique experiences and situations that we've like gone through that those are the type of stories I want to tell. So I would always mention to my dad, like one day I'm going to make a film about like you and my uncles or like you and your brothers. Like I want to make a film about your life. Like, you know, there'd be moments where he'd like tell me these stories about his childhood and like, I would always tell him like, I'm going to put that in a film one day. So I think when I approached him with like the idea of like, okay, this is specifically what I want to make it about. Um, he already was kind of prepared for it and he was already for it. Um, I think he was like excited when I like mentioned it to him. And I just don't think that he really knew how serious I was about it. I think he was just like, oh, like, yeah, you're going to like, you know, you're going to make a film. You always say this. But um, then when I went for it, like he was definitely very, excited and involved in the process. So it was nice to kind of have that like um, positive reinforcement from him. That's great. I mean, he certainly seems like a willing participant to the point of like co-authoring the film. Um, well, as we're talking about family and just like the family dynamic, right? Sharam, the dynamic in your film is extremely intense, um, but it's also in a way, at least to me, just like kind of the environment I grew up in um, and like the people that like kind of like lived and I, so I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. Um, and your film reminded me a lot of the, just sort of like, yeah, like a sort of a pent up energy and aggression that I, I saw a lot growing up between like young men. So I was wondering if you could talk about developing that intensity on screen and sort of maintaining it throughout without ever betraying the, the realism factor of it. Interesting question. Um, I think um, the, I think just like the actor that the lead just did a fantastic job of just like understanding, like he, he was one of those um, actors that he's just told me like, man, if you want it, if you want me to go harder or if you want it like a stronger, like, you know, energy, just say up or down. So I just have to tell him, all right, keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. And then he would just get angry and like he just, he can maintain that, um, that energy and that like aggression and that rage, like at, at like a very, like, um, I don't know. He could really, he could really level it out really well, like whatever level he wanted. So he, I think that was mostly like the actor was just able to like perform like solidly. I guess then conversely, how did you balance that with the younger brother? who, I mean, he eventually reaches a crescendo of intensity, right? Like one of the most evocative images in your film is him screaming in the shower. Um, and go oh, and the younger brother, like screaming outside of it. But the, if you could talk about um, working with him and sort of creating that dynamic between the two of them. Yeah, so um, that was, uh, I think, hmm. Hmm. Oh man, I, don't, I really don't know. Like that's, I think that's definitely like an actor's thing. I think the way that, like the all, all the kids that were um, all, were acting, they they all became really close and they became friends. So like, they could all bounce off of each other's energies really well. And I made it seem very real because a lot of the contact was physically like real contact. So when they were pushing, they were actually pushing. Um, it wasn't to the point where they're hurting each other, but like there was, there was, you could feel it. So it was all, I tried to make it as real as possible and like everything as real as possible for them to really dive in. And we did a lot of takes 
Uh, the thing was like we did a lot of takes where I was pushing them do it again and again to the point where they could get that intensity. Uh, so that's, that's like one of the reasons why I like, kept doing it. Because I, I did not know how to like make films properly at that point. So like I kept doing it until I felt like this is what I wanted, even when they were tired and that. So when you have that much like takes, you'll get something that works out. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. But also, I mean, there's there's a lot to be said about the way that you know you actually directed them too. And I guess it's I was then related to that. Was there like lots of rehearsal, or did you sort of just like dive right in? Um, you talk about them all becoming friends, and I wasn't sure if they spent a lot of time together beforehand, or if it was all sort of created on set. Yeah, I did do a little bit of rehearsal, but the friends part bit came because I I shot it so many times, like I reshot it so many times. <laughs> like, I became crazy for that movie for some reason. Like I just, I wanted it. I was like a perfectionist, like super perfectionist. It's like I, I literally, like I shot the same scene for for four days, and it was only one minute long. <laughs> it's like, bro, we gotta come back, man, come back. And like, this is like the crew. The crew wasn't even a crew. It's like whatever kids from down the street could like come down and help if they didn't have like homework or like work or school. It's like, bro, can you come down? Can you come down? We're doing it again. We're doing it again. <laughs> it was just like, it, so that's how they became friends. It was just like a party after. And we all, we always uh, like, I would take them out to good restaurants. So we just chilled out after everyone sure. came really close. Well, that's real independent film energy, you know, um, <laughs> bringing it all, you know, like everyone hanging out and like kind of just like calling down the street, asking for favors. Yeah. Um, we did actually have, it looks like a pair of audience questions here. So um, I guess since we're still talking about uh, brothers, if you, Sharam, a question from the audience is, um, why don't you see the mom's face? And you know, you talk about being very precise and like kind of arranging everything in a specific way. Um, you know, it kind of reminded me of like the Charlie Brown type treatment of adult, mm. right? Where like you can't see there, but naturally we can hear the mother speak. So yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about that perspective, why uh, she was framed that way. For sure, for sure. So um, when 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 people are young, this is how I remember it. But um, when when I used to see like when I used to remember adults, or when you have adult characters that are very polarizing in a negative sense or very positive sense, they become either godlike or demon like to a kid. Because you can remember like your teachers seem to be like these magnificent beings that knew everything, and then if there's like like a really mean adult, like they become like a monster. So when you don't see someone's face, it rips the humanity away from them. So then you can, um, it, it increases the amount of distance and the, that breaks the connection, the human connection. So that's why. Yeah, I mean, it certainly had that effect on me um, in the sense that the film is limited to both of the brothers' perspectives. Um, so naturally there is like, that's another way of just like kind of ramping up the, the intensity there. Um, another question we have is for Mariah and there, the audience is asking, so have the brothers seen the film and then maybe what their, their response to it was. And then I guess related to that, just your father's reaction at like seeing the, the finished film. Yeah. So, um, so the film is a, uh, like, you know, it's about my dad, his younger brother, then his older brother. Um, my oldest, his oldest brother, so my oldest uncle, his name is Raymond. Um, he watched the film um, and he really enjoyed it and was moved by it. And my uh, youngest uncle, my dad's younger brother, who a lot of the film is based around, um, he, was ac he actually just got out um, literally two weeks ago and he just recently watched the film. And so it was one of those things, I'm here in New York, there in Michigan, so I wasn't, I envisioned my first time watching it with him, you know, being in person, but you know, my dad called me and let me know, like, he just watched the film, like he really enjoyed it, um, was also moved by it. And I guess talking about my dad's reaction to it. So like kind of how I mentioned previously, um, I edited and completed the film while I was away from my dad when I was like in Saginaw with my sister. So when I came back to Grand Rapids and I had like, my finalized lot cut of the film. Um, I went in my mom and dad's room and I had my laptop and I had like the exported version of the film. And I just gave them my laptop and I was like, here, I'm gonna like exit the room. I'm gonna shut the door. I'll let you guys watch it. Cause I, I guess I was like kind of nervous to watch it with him for the first time. Um, 
And so then I like, I knew how long the film was in my head. So I like set a timer on my phone. I was like, okay, I'll go in when the film's over. So I like left the room, went to my room, did whatever I did. Then I came back and I came in the room and I saw that my dad had tears in his eyes. And for me, that was like confirmation that like, this is it. This is the film. This is like, I accomplished everything that I set out to. So yeah, he had a very emotional reaction to the film, but that was, um, that was very confirming to me that like I did what I set out to do. So that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, anytime we can make our parents cry with something we've created um, is just like a, such a it's a treasured moment for sure. Um, well, you know, I, thank you both so much for for taking the time to chat about your films here with me tonight, and just thank you again for sharing your films with Cine Youth. Um, they're they're wonderful films. They're very beautiful and. The, they left an impression on the entire programming team um, when we watched them. So it's been it's been a real treat getting a chance to to talk to you all. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time here. I just wanted to like let everyone know who might be watching to be sure to keep checking out the films in Cine Youth. Um, there's a lot of wonderful films in the program, uh, so be for be sure to check those out for throughout the next week. And yeah, thank you, thank you both of you. Have a great night.